Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Kathleen Rourke from Candlewick Press, and I'm delighted to have the honor of introducing the third episode in the Black Theater series, Bringing Books to Your Classroom Community, a collaboration between the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project and Candlewick Press. Each month, we will be featuring a Black author or illustrator in conversation with Sonia Cherry Paul, Director of Diversity and Equity at Teachers College Reading and Writing Project. Tonight, we welcome Tammy Charles, a former teacher and New York Times bestselling author of numerous books for young readers of all ages. Her Candlewick Press titles include Freedom Soup and the forthcoming My Day with the Panier. Sonia and Tammy will be able to reply to comments during the presentation, so we invite you to use the comments section to ask questions. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Hi, Tammy. Hi, Sonia. Uh, it's so exciting to talk to you, not only as an author, but as an educator. Yes. So let's talk about your time as a teacher. Can you tell us what grades and content areas did you teach? And also, I imagine it must. Um, how does having a teaching background influence your writing? So I became a teacher by accident. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be a teacher. I went to school to become a news reporter. That's what I thought I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't quite happen. When I graduated from college, my mom told me, hey, you have a year to, to find yourself. And, and while you're doing that, you know, you could work as a substitute teacher. So I did that and I fell in love. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I got hooked. Uh -huh. And next thing I know, uh, yeah, 14 years went by and I, I loved it. I loved mm. my students. I loved the children that I worked with. It was such a melting pot. I write for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I write for the students that I taught for 14 years. I write to show them on the page I write to show the fullness of who they are and who they can be. You know, my, my students from Haiti, my students from Dominican Republic, I had students from everywhere. And just being with them all those years, that's what inspired the stories that I tell today. Wow, that's amazing. And, and while we're thinking about all that influences your writing, and as you so beautifully said, it's your students that you are thinking about and writing for, um, let's chat a little bit about uh, the Own Voices movement yes. started by Corinne Divis back in 2015 on Twitter. Um, there can be resistance in response to the Own Voices movement. Those who say the racial identity of an author doesn't matter when writing stories for children. Um, why do Own Voices matter? Well, own voices matter because when you grow up like I did or like you did, I'm sure, reading books featuring characters who don't look like you, who aren't from the places that you are and their family and friends demographics, you know, it looks nothing like what you were accustomed to, then clearly we need more stories that represent those voices. So for those reasons, own voices mm -hmm. matters for sure. Um, I do feel that we, we need more own voice stories written by authors who represent that voice. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's just so that, yes, it's for our children, our children of color who need to see their lives affirmed but equally so, white children need to see that too. They need to see that their friends are, are worthy of respect. Their friends have this, this great you know, range of all that they are and all that they could be. It's important uh, for those children to see that as well. So yeah. I, I do agree with the own voices matter, but if I'm gonna play devil's advocate for one second, when I think of a book like A Long Walk to Water mm -hmm. by Linda Sue Park, mm -hmm. I love that story. 
Yeah. Clearly, you know, Linda is not um, of African descent, mm-hmm. but boy, did she really do the work mm-hmm. to tell that story. So if you're going to do it, mm-hmm. you got to do the work, you yeah. know? Yeah. And, um, and I, I love that book. So yeah, I just wanted to play devil's advocate for one second, because there are those books who aren't own voices and they're just so equally impactful for, for me, at least as a reader. Right. But, yeah. but on the flip side, yeah, yeah. We need own voices <laughs> for sure. And in a moment, I want to show and, and share your beautiful book, Freedom Soup. And, you know, anyone who knows me knows how strongly I feel about Own Voices books and that educators should be reaching for these books first. Um, I just don't think there's enough in acknowledgement about how white authors and white characters have and continue to dominate children's literature and how often white authors writing about characters of color in particular can just get it wrong, leading to misrepresentations and distortions and and inaccuracies and a lack of nuance about the lives of black and brown people. And this is at best, right? At worst, there can be a perpetuation of racist tropes and, and stereotypes. And I've been noticing you know, lately this brown washing of characters in books written by white authors that leave me wondering, you know, for what purpose are these characters brown? Certainly uh, the content of the story doesn't call for it or address it. And, you know, these books end up in classrooms and curriculums with educators believing them to be representative of diversity. diversity. Yeah, yeah. And so we need We really need publishers to do better, to interrupt this practice in children's literature. And we need teachers to think more critically about books they're reaching for, to consider who is the author of this text and what makes them well suited for this story. Like with Linda Sue Park, right? Along the water. We know that Linda Sue Park um, and Salva Dute both came from the same part of the uh, of the of the country. I think it's Rochester, New York. Um, she wrote that book with him, um, you know, in conversations with him, many many conversations with him. And so, let's let's just think about you know who is the author of a text and what makes them well suited to write about black and brown people through black and brown characters. Could you talk about the incredible Freedom Soup, your proximity to Haitian culture and how this uniquely positions you to write this story with authenticity and care and nuance? And I'm going to share my screen so um, folks can see the beautiful cover of your book while you're telling us about this. Okay. So... The running joke in my family is that I am Haitian by relation. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I am married to a Haitian man. Mm -hmm. I am married to my best friend who just so happens to be Haitian. I've known him uh, since I was 10 years old. We lived in the same town, grew up in the same town. Um, I liked him (laughs) once I became a teenager and he's just been around the whole time. So (laughs) this is a 24 years of, of being loved and embraced by a family who I truly call my own. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean it when I say they are equally, if not more uh, important than some of my own blood family. So um, to write a story like Freedom Soup when I am not Haitian, um, I wrote it for, for many reasons, but I'll tell you this. I, I had the permission and I had the support and I had the help of the Haitian family who basically raised me. Who, who loved and nurtured me for the past 24 years. Mm. And even in all of that, I still don't get everything right. <laughs> um, this story came about 
because, well, when I was, I believe I must have been 16 or 17. And that was when I was first introduced to this tradition of on New Year's Day, we eat this soup. It's called Soup Jumu. And the character Tigun in this book, Freedom Soup, she is modeled after my husband's actual grandmother, our Tigun. Tigun means little grandma in Creole. And she was this little feisty lady who told me, if you want to date my grandson, you're going to have to learn how to make this soup. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to know the story behind it. So mm. as she told me the story behind this soup, soup jumu, which was this, it is this hearty vegetable based soup that long ago on the island of Haiti, the enslaved made this soup for their enslavers. But here's the kicker. They weren't allowed to eat it. Mm. So imagine that. And, and then they had the Haitian revolution, which lasted for 12 years, fighting and battling for their independence from France, their colonizers. Well, when they earned their independence, what was the first thing they did? Hmm. They had the very thing that was long denied them. So, so as, as she told me this story, and I'm eating the soup, I'm like, oh my God, this does taste like freedom. <laughs> it is literally the most delicious thing I've ever had. Haitian food period is great. Caribbean food period is great. But this soup, there's a story behind it. Mm -hmm. There's power and there's beauty and there's resistance and there's love. There's all these things that go into this soup and it's weaved into the fabric of this story. There's a story mm -hmm. there. So I learned the story 24 years ago because I was, I was dating this guy who turned up, you know, we ended up being married. Um, but then life changes when you become a parent. Mm. So we have this son, this beautiful boy who as his mom and as an author and as a teacher, I want to make sure that whatever I'm writing, yes, I think of my students, but you know, my son is at the forefront of everything that I do, every story that I write. So I wanted to make sure that I wrote a story that he could see himself in mm -hmm. For those moments in his life where when he turns on the news and the news tells him that Haiti is a crap hole country, mm -hmm. that he will know, wait a minute. No, it's not. Those aren't the people that I come from. I come from a legacy of people who literally freed themselves from bondage. And guess what? Mm -hmm. My mama wrote a book about it. That's right. <laughs> so, so, you know, to do that. Uh, to, you know, to put this in a story, even if my son was the only one to ever read it, mm. my job is done. Mm. So that's why I wrote it. And I'm I wrote it with the permission of my family. The only mm. regret that I have is that Sigun did not live long enough to see the mm. story published. She knew I wrote it. She was involved. You know, she knew I got the book deal. She knew I wrote it. And picture books take a long time to publish. Yeah. Um, so sadly, you know, she didn't see it published, but it is my greatest honor to bring this book to life for her, for my son, for all people, but especially those Haitian children who need to see something that combats how they are portrayed in the media. So that's why. Oh, Tammy, oh, so much of what you've said, I would like to just, you know, echo and echo and echo and you know, um, that you are so deeply um, and personally immersed in Haitian culture, not as a kind of tourist who's just simply fascinated by the people and the culture, but through close family connections. And still, you say you write with the permission from and help of yeah. your Haitian family and community is such a, 
a powerful message for educators and students and authors and publishers to hear. Yeah. So they will um, set me straight. Let me tell you, my, Mm -hmm. my family does not hold back. They're not my in-laws. They're my family. Yes. And they will set me straight. So, um, you know, if, if I'm doing something that doesn't work or doesn't quite represent the culture, well, Mm -hmm. you know, knock on wood that hasn't happened yet because they're with me every step of the way. Right. I'm texting, I'm calling, I'm asking, I'm observing. So I, I really have that support every step of the way. I'm thankful for it. That kind of due diligence we need to see with all authors if they are if they are writing a book about um, cultures and uh, racial groups that are not their own. But Tammy, we rung in um, the new year on January first, and you just mentioned um, you know a Haitian. Ind- it's also Haitian Independence Day. Yes. Um, and you've gifted educators with this beautiful, not only this beautiful book, but the author's note in the back of Freedom Soup, which really can help students understand the significance of the Haitian Revolution um, and help teachers teach their students about it. Um, We know there are so many gaps in children's literature around stories that center the lives of, of, of Black and Brown people and Haitian culture in particular. So this is one book I want educators to know that it's just so significant to students right now, this time of year, but also all year. And I love how um, in the book, it says T. Grand, but you pronounced it differently. Yes. It's Can, tea, am I? It's T. Gun. Like, T. Gun. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> T. Gun. I Good. love that T. Gun in the book says, and I'm just going to share my screen uh, one more time because I want educators to be able to um, pick up on this when they're sharing it with their students. T. Gun says, nothing in this world is free, not even freedom. And I just think that, you know, this is so important because it brings that nuance and complexity to, to freedom and helps kids think about, think about more deeply that, you know, freedom shouldn't be so complex, you know, but, but it is. And there have been and continue to be these different versions of freedom for some people um, versus others. So, I'm sure celebrating this year was different for you and your family. And I wanted to take a look at this page and maybe you can talk to us about what it looks like to celebrate um, Haitian Independence Day. And yeah, tell us about it. Oh, I'm getting teary eyed. Hold on. (laughs) This is my favorite spread. Oh, you got me with this one. This is my favorite spread of the book. And I'm going to tell you why, because that's us. That wasn't us this year. Mm. This year, celebrating New Year's Day, celebrating January 1st, celebrating um, Haitian independence looked very different. And this is what it looked like. I made the soup at home by myself. I put it in um, lots of Tupperware and I became an Uber Eats driver. (laughs) And I drove and delivered. Um, I can't wait to experience that again. I want to just point out, yes, this this is a typical gathering of of Haitian families, but I would even venture to say that there's a universality of this as well. Even if you aren't Haitian, even if you aren't black, I bet, I bet you you've experienced that. Yeah. You've experienced all the family together eating and you've got people dancing and you've got people cooking in the kitchen. You've got people playing games and the kids just being kids and just experiencing how food brings us all together as family, as, as a people. Um, yeah, this is my family and that's how we 
that's how we ring in the new year every year. And it certainly didn't look like that this year, but the love is still there. Yeah. We should also shout out the uh, oh, yes. talented illustrator. Jacqueline Alcantara. She did an amazing job. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think that's why I just got so teary eyed because I, I love her work. And then you, you know, you turn to my favorite spread and just realizing that I, that we didn't get that this year and I can't wait to get it again. It just got me all in oh. my feelings. You got me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and Actually, I, I need to take a sip of water. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to continue, you know, talking about um, your work and, and your, um, tribute to to Haitian culture and filling this gap in 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 children's literature and centering um, Haitian people with the upcoming My Day with the Panye, yes. um, which is another beautiful book and a really um, fantastic author's note for readers to learn more about Haitian culture. Um, so. Tell us a little bit about this and what readers can look forward to when this comes out. So my day with the Ponye, it is the story of a little girl named Fallon, who is my cousin, actually. So I wrote this in tribute to my cousin Fallon. Um, The wearing of the Ponye, which is basket in Creole, this is something that it's, it's done in several countries, by the way. Of course, you know, everyone has their different names for it, but essentially it's women who carry the basket on their head to go to market. And at, mar- at the market, you buy goods and food for your family and you bring it back home. And I've seen this in pictures, I've seen it in, in, in media, and I've even seen it in person. It is such a beautiful, uh, almost dance, a graceful dance of balancing the basket on your head and walking upright with pride because the things that are in that basket, that is, that's what will feed your family, sustain your family. And Fallon wants so desperately to walk with the panier on her head. Mm. Um, but she has to learn that it's it's not something, it's not a skill that you just know how to do or, you, you know, you acquire it out of nowhere. There are lessons to be taught. And um, so we follow her on her journey to market as her mother is telling her what goes in to wearing this panier, which is not just about food in a basket. It's about strength. It's about grace. It's about standing tall, even when the earth shook in Haiti all those years ago. Mm. How we as a people stood tall even through that. That's how you wear the ponye. So she learns all of that. And by the end of the book, she has a few moments where it doesn't go so well. (laughs) (laughs) But by the end of the book, as you see there, she gets it. Yeah. She understands that it's it's more than just wearing something on your head. The panye is, it's family, it's love, it's culture. Mm. Oh my goodness, Tammy. You know, when I look across your body of work, um, you know, what jumps out to me is it seems intentional that you take an, in, an, an intentional approach to to celebrate and affirm blackness and to and to also represent a full range of lived experiences of black people um, rather than solely locating them um, in oppression. In yes. your work, readers see black characters spending time with family. They see um, black characters trying out for the ballet. Um, yes like in this other upcoming um, book that you have, um, Zuri Ray tries for ballet. Um, Your readers see black characters spending time with family, um, experiencing joy. Is it it an intentional approach for you um, to write books in this way? And, And why is it important 
that you are writing the full range of lived experiences of, of Black people? So I want to show the fullness of who we are because everything that I write, I have that in, in mind. When you, when you turn on the media, when you look at certain movies, the way we are often portrayed, it's not always in the best light. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important. I think it's important for people to know, all people to know that, hey, we can, we can be anything. We can do anything. We can come from anywhere. We're not a monolith. And um, my, my goal is to hopefully educate readers on that, that you can, you, you have, you can want, you know, you can trial for the ballet. Sure. You can trial for lacrosse. Um, you can be happy. You can be sad. I write some stories that can be painful, you know, that kind of shows some pain, but I, I will always try my best to infuse joy in my writing, no matter what, even if it's a tough topic. So I really want to show the full range of who we are as people. Mm -hmm. And I do think that we have to really start seeing Blackness on a global scale. Mm -hmm. And my world travels have really opened my eyes to that. Even in my teaching days, like when I was teaching, I did teach ELL students. So I taught black and brown children. I taught black children from Colombia. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're there too. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're everywhere. So I, I want to make sure that my stories kind of reflect that mm -hmm. to show the diversity within the diversity of who we are. Yeah. And another thing that you do so beautifully in your work, you affirm blackness and brown people. You also increase awareness for kids. You know, we, we use that beautiful metaphor about books being mirrors and windows. Yeah. Um, and so there's another book that I want to put on educators radar, which is Fearless Mary. And um, I remember being in a bookstore and I came across it and I stood right in the middle of the aisle standing there reading this book because I have to admit, I did not know anything yep. about yeah. Mary Fields until I read your book. And there's so many stories about Black people that have been, that have been silenced. And, yep. and soon many educators will um, start teaching about westward movement. Okay. And Mary Fields is someone that their students should know about. So what made you write about her? I read in your, again, you have gorgeous author's notes. I read in the author's note that it seems like it started with a picture and an expression Facebook. on her face. Facebook. What? So let me take a second to shout out my Facebook friend, Harriet Page. Harriet is someone that I've known um, since I was probably 13 years old. Harriet Page is, um, I believe she's a retired, uh, she worked for the Social Security Administration and she's from Maryland. Well, mm -hmm. she often posts the most beautiful unknown moments and facts and people in black history. Like that is her brand. <laughs> and I believe that she was the one who posted a picture of Mary Fields a few years ago. And I forget what the tagline was, but it was something about Mary Fields in the West. And I saw this woman who I, I'm afraid to even admit this, that at first I thought it was Harriet Tubman. <laughs> And I get that from the kids whenever I do my presentations on her. So I love, you know, telling them, no, it, it's not Harriet Tubman. This yeah. is someone else. But she was on, like, she was perched on a horse and she had this wagon behind her and she just looked mm -hmm. so bad. You fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, who is this woman? Uh -huh. And when I looked her up, I, I read that she was the first woman of color, the first black woman to deliver mail here in the United States. Now, that may not seem like a big deal in these days of Amazon when you can open your phone. And I just ordered something last night. It was on my doorstep this morning. 
<laughs> right? But yeah. in the 1800s, it wasn't like that. They delivered mail via stagecoach. And this was a very dangerous job, which is why they did not want to give the job to women. And they especially didn't want to give it to black women. And mm-hmm. they especially didn't want to give this job to an ex-slave. Mm-hmm. So it's like she had all of these strikes against her in going for a job that was never meant for her in the first place. Mm-hmm. It was a dangerous job. Uh, thieves would uh, would like steal from you and wolves would attack. They would try and attack you because on the wagons, you know, they had food on the wagons and supplies. And so wild animals and thieves wanted what was in the wagon. Well, Mary... She got the job anyway. She mm-hmm. she tried out against like 40 some odd cowboys and she beat them all. So that's what made her the first. And and I said, oh, this woman was fearless. Like, yeah. I got to write this story because these kids need to know, like Mary Fields was the Amazon delivery of the 1800s. So I just it's it's this little known story. Uh, And, you know, I got to say when my I'm so happy that my agent believed in this story mm. because this was the story. This is the little book that could or mm -hmm. I should say couldn't because we got a lot of, oh, wow, this is great. But mm, we've already met our quota Mm. for black biographies for this year. But but you know what? I'm so glad my agent never gave up on this story. It took us a while to to find a home for it. She never gave up. Of course, I never gave up. And how lucky am I that this story is in the world for kids to learn about someone other than Dr. King. Dr. King is very important. But teachers, when it is time for Black History Month, please let's think broader here. Let's give our students more choices outside of Dr. King and Rosa Parks because there are so many unknown histories, little known stories of people who made an impact. So why not introduce our our children, all children to those type of stories? So that's why I wrote Fearless Mary. Oh, and I gotta tell you, um, folks shouldn't just locate this book in Black History Month again. Yeah, yeah. You're teaching westward movement, then this book should fit squarely among all of the resources that you're bringing in um, to use with students. Kids should know the story of Mary Fields. I agree. So, you know, two things I recommend educators look for in books, Tammy, um, books that are by and about people of color are the ways that authors work to affirm racial and cultural identities as well as help students become more aware um, to develop their critical consciousness around systems of inequities like Mary Fields faced um, and the Haitian uh, revolution. Um, so that kids can acquire the tools to, that they need to speak to speak back to this. And again, looking across your work, you do both. We see it in, in so many of your books, particularly in All Because You Matter, which just fills me up. Uh, you get emotional. I get emotional reading All Because You Matter. It just affirms the rightful place of Black children that they have in the world. It raises students' awareness about inequities. Can you, while I, while I share this gorgeous book that you've created with Brian Collier, can you um, just talk about this work that you two gave, gifted us with? Can you just talk about All Because You Matter? Um, Absolutely. Here it is. And you know what? I wanna make sure, cause I didn't say this in my last piece with Fear- Fearless Mary before I move on. I wanna make sure I just shout out Claire Allman, my illustrator for Fearless Mary. Thank you, Claire, for bringing yes. Mary to life. And of course, Jacqueline for Freedom Soup. I just want to make sure I yep. don't forget that. Okay, so on to All Because You Matter. This was the book that I didn't want to write, believe it or not, because it represented the talk that I never wanted to have, right? Right. <laughs> it's hard for, for parents to have the talk with yes. your child 
you know, and then you factor in, I have a black son. I have a son Mm -hmm. who, who lives in, in a society that will, by the time he is maybe 11 or 12, and he starts getting a little peach fuzz right here. They're not going to see him as a little boy anymore. He'll be a man in the eyes of society. So I find that um, our children don't get to be children long enough. So I, I didn't want to have this talk with him. I just wanted to keep my son tiny and innocent forever, not knowing anything that, that goes on in the real world. Mm. Um, and that worked for a little bit. <laughs> And then he went to school. (laughs) Yeah. It's a privilege that parents of color do not have. We don't have the privilege of not talking to our kids about about the ills of the world. So I knew I needed to have this talk with my child. You know, that important talk where you balance the, the reality that, yes, humanity can be beautiful. This world is beautiful. There are so many wonderful people on this planet, but sometimes you will encounter people or moments where you will experience, maybe you're feeling like you don't matter. Mm. Maybe someone will say something or someone will do something and maybe it'll be because of your skin color. And, And so how do I balance (laughs) those very different concepts. I knew I needed to write this book. I knew I needed to position it as a love letter. Yes. For every tough conversation that I will have with my son, undoubtedly, even still through as the years go on, Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that I begin those conversations with reminding him of his worth. Yes. And reminding him of all the ways that he matters and that he matters because he mattered because he, before he even got here, Mm -hmm. um, that there's a place for him, no matter what anyone says or does. The people who came before him laid that groundwork so that he could know why he matters. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I set out to, to write this book for him. And it became so much bigger than that because I knew that this is for all children of color, but this is for all children too. Because like I said earlier, even children who who are not from BIPOC communities, Mm -hmm. even those children need to see our lives being affirmed. Yep. So that's what makes it a universal message for Mm -hmm. everyone. So, yeah, I, I, I wrote this for my baby and it is the greatest gift. I, I always say, honestly, if I write, if I don't write any other book, I'm good with this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like if, if yeah. I quit today, right. I can quit on this and I'd, I'd this. be happy. Yeah. I've said all I needed to say. <laughs> and, and Tammy, I want to echo what you just said. It's important for educators to understand whether you teach students who are predominantly students of color whether you teach students who are predominantly white or anything in between, it is so critical to have books like these, um, All Because You Matter and all of your books um, in the classroom to affirm black identities, to affirm blackness and white kids need to see blackness affirmed as well. So I just wanted to echo that. Tell us Tammy, what's coming up for you? What can readers expect? Ah, so, because apparently I just want to write all the things. (laughs) (laughs) I tried my hand at writing in verse. That was very, very tough. But uh, my next book publishes on February 2nd. It is titled Muted. Mm -hmm. And it's a a novel in verse about a 17-year-old girl named Denver and her friends, Shaq and Zali, and they have these big dreams of becoming an R&B senior group, kind of like in Vogue back in the day, but like uh-huh, now. Uh-huh. And uh, they get that chance when they meet R&B superstar, Sean Mercury Ellis. He is an angel at first. 
but a monster in the end. Uh-huh. And Denver has to find a way to mute that monster and raise her voice and, and take her power back for herself, but also for her friends as well. So it's called Muted and that publishes February 2nd. Wow. That's exciting. Very. Yep. Me, in, in your author's note um, in Freedom Soup, you, you write about the importance of carrying on traditions with your son, about teaching him about his heritage. And in your author's note in All Because You Matter, you write that you want to remind children, especially those who have been marginalized, that they matter. Mm-hmm. And Tammy, I wanna say that your work matters. It is a tribute to black children. It matters for all children. And I wanna ask, what does it mean to you to be a black creator? So this is the second time you got me. <laughs> like my eyes are like tears. <laughs> Thank you for those kind words. I'm gonna tell you why, because we are, we are in the midst of a pandemic. And these are some trying times. And I gotta say like, this was a tough, 2020 was a tough year for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I had those moments where I felt like, well, mm, nothing I'm doing matters. So, um, so to hear that is very affirming for me. (laughs) Um, What does it mean to be a black creator? Mm -hmm. Um, To you, to me, uh, it means so many things, but I'm going to say that the first thing that comes to mind is honor. I, I drool on the heels of the success of those who came before me. Mm. Um, I stand on the shoulders of those who are no longer here. So, so to do this work and to have even one person tell me that my words matter or my words open their eyes to something that they never experienced or knew before. Um, That's an honor Mm. for me. So to be a black creator, that's literally the key word that I think of. Mm. It's an honor. Tammy, thank you for giving us so much of your time. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed this insightful, inspiring conversation and will bring this new knowledge back to your classrooms. Please join us in February for the next conversation in the series. Our guest will be Frederick Joseph, author of the New York Times bestselling The Black Friend on being a better white person. For a full schedule of conversations and links to an accompanying podcast, please visit blackcreatorseries.candlewick.com and check the Teachers College Reading Writing Project's Facebook page for past episodes. Thank you.